Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Fastly stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Fastly was founded in 2011. In 2015, Google partnered with Fastly and other content delivery network providers to offer services to its users. Fastly is a content delivery network company that helps users view digital content more quickly. The company also provides security, video delivery, and edge computing services. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 10.9 billion market cap. They're trading at $96 a share and they have 102 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you forecast a future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flows, cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has negative free cash flow every year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses and they also have negative net income each year. The revenue looks pretty good. It grows every single year from 100 million to 267 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference between those two numbers is the gross profit, and it looks like their gross profit is increasing each year. Below that is operating expenses. It is typical in the first few years of a company to have higher operating expenses than gross profit. It can take time to become more efficient and economies of scale set in. So the company has negative operating income each year. And they don't have too much debt so their interest expense is pretty low. The bottom of the income statement is the net income and they're negative each year. This is their revenue in the United States and revenue outside of the U.S. About 75% is in the U.S. and their U.S. and non-U.S. revenue is growing each year. And this is their revenue by enterprise customers and non-enterprise customers. Enterprise customers are much larger than non-enterprise. And you can see their enterprise customers have doubled since 2017 and their non-enterprise customers have gone up about 50% in that time. This is the statement of cash flows, and the way you calculate free cash flow, it's operating cash flow minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are investments in property, plant, and equipment. So their free cash flow is negative each year, but they did have positive operating cash flow in the trailing 12 months, but they're still investing a lot in their business, which is why they had negative free cash flow. And the company does fund a lot of its business on capital stock, 50 million in 2017, then 40 million, 192 million, then 275 million. They also issue debt each year, but it seems like they're paying back the debt as much as they're issuing it. I always like to look at operating cash flow a little closer, because I believe operating cash flow is the most important part of the financial statements. Because the purpose of starting any business is to provide a product or service in exchange for money. If you have negative operating cash flow for an extended period of time, your business cannot survive. You can only issue so much debt and equity before it runs out. So the company had negative operating cash flow in 2017, 18, and 19, but it did have positive in the trailing 12 months. A lot of people look at net income because net income is the profit and loss for the company, but there's a lot of accounting things going on. Operating cash flow is a better indicator of a company's financial health. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, it starts with net income, and then you have to add back the non-cash items from the income statement. So the company passed through a $19 million expense on the income statement for depreciation, but this was a non-cash item. They didn't actually pay $19 million. So you have to add this back on the operating cash flow section. They also gave $39 million of stock to their employees, but once again, this was a non-cash item, so we have to add it back. So the $39 million decreases the company's net income. So you could actually have negative net income, which this company did, and positive operating cash flow. Also on the income statement, you might add non-cash items. There was this other non-cash items where they added 2.6 million. So we have to minus it from the statement of cash flows. Also to calculate operating cash flow, you have to adjust for changes in working capital. The company's accounts payable increased $29 million in the trailing 12 months, so that's an increase of cash of $29 million. Accounts payable is similar to taking a loan. Let's look at a capital structure. They have $258 million of equity, $30 million of debt, but they have negative $101 million of net debt. 
Net debt is debt minus cash. So if they use the cash in their balance sheet to pay down their debt, they would still have $101 million of cash left over. That's a really good sign. And their weighted average cost of capital is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt, and that's 13%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for. That's $10 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $6.8 billion. We divide that by 102 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $66. They're trading at $96, so they're trading at a 45% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street doesn't have a value for this company. This is where the stock has been trading since it IPO'd last year. And you could see it peaked about $120, $130, but it's come back down. It looks like it's come up quite a bit in the past couple of months, but it's still trading at a pretty nice discount to its all-time high. In the past 52 weeks, the S&P 500 went up 15%. This stock has outperformed the S&P by 25 times, 2,500%. It has a really wide 52-week range, a low of $11, a high of $136. So of the 102 million shares outstanding, there are 91 million shares on float. Floating shares are the shares available to the public. The more shares available, the better. When a company has a low percentage on float, it can be a really volatile stock since there's less shares in the market to be traded. And there are 17.5 million shares that are shorted. So the shortage shares as a percent of float is almost 19%. That's a really high percentage. So it seems like a lot of investors are indicating these shares are going to go down in price. This company has never paid a dividend and doesn't plan on paying a dividend in the future. The plan is to retain all the cash to grow the company. If you invested $10,000 into this company when it IPO'd last year, you'd have $40,000 today. That's a pretty great return on investment. The company had 1,582 customers at the end of 2018 and 1,743 at the end of 2019. The number of enterprise customers, which are the larger paying customers, that went from 227 to 288. And their dollar-based net expansion rate, which is how much money the company generates for each user, went up also from 132% to 135.5%. These are the company's top shareholders. Abdiel Capital owns 8.4%. Arthur Bergman owns 8%, the Vanguard Group owns 6.5%, then Morgan Stanley, Wellrock, O'Reilly Alpha, and BlackRock. The average age of the leadership team is 44.5 years, and the average tenure is 3 years. The CEO has only been with the company for one year, and the compensation package is $2.5 million. The other co-founder has also been there one year, and their compensation package is $6.5 million. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 12.4. The median is 14.8. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so they have negative P.E. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They are 36.7. So this means investors are paying $37 for $1 revenue. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They are 38, much higher than the median and average. The way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet. And their tangible equity is a little less at $256 million. That means they have a small amount of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Their intangible assets are right here. They have IP addresses valued at $1.5 million. And their domain name valued at $39,000. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They have negative EBIT, so they have negative interest coverage ratio. ROE is net income over equity, negative net income, negative ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They're at 6.7, so they have more than enough current assets to cover their current liabilities. Their current assets are cash of 131 million, receivables of 37 million, prepaid assets of 11 million, and restricted cash of 70 million. You generally don't need a current ratio above two, but when you have a young company that uses lots of cash to grow its business, you need to have high current assets. Their free cash flow in the trailing 12 months was negative 28 million, but their working capital is 212 million. So it looks like they have enough capital on hand to get them through the next few years without going into more debt. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos of 20 companies in the same industry as Fastly, and if Fastly has a number in red, they're worse than the average. 
They have a number in green. They're better than the average. They're a lot worse in PE ratio. They're a little worse in price to sales and price to book. They have a really high current ratio. ROE, they're negative. They're low in debt, only 10%. Average is 30%. And market cap is $11 billion. Average is $34 billion. And they don't pay a dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 45% premium. Although their future looks good, I think the stock is way too high. If it comes down another 20, 30, 40%, I think it would be a good value. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.